So Paul, so far we've been talking about uh, distant solar systems or distant systems that have one planet. Now our own solar system has eight planets and nine, ten, depending on if you count Pluto and Sedna and things. Are there any systems that look more like our own um, that have multiple planets? We have to bear in mind that with current technology, which our own solar system, it looks like a no planet system because none of our planets are within current sensitivity. Um, but there are some now which have multiple planets. The most famous one is Upsilon Andromedae. Here's the original discovery data. So you've got these points over here, and they've managed, don't know how, to fit that particular sine wave to these things. You do have to be a true believer, I think. Uh, but uh, actually, the data does speak volumes. Yeah, I mean, the velocity is jumping around by an enormous amount. But there are a couple, like that point's kind of deviant. You know? So back in this paper back in 1997, uh, Paul Butler um, came up with the idea that there was one planet. That was a classic hot Jupiter in a, in a period of 4.6 days, very close in. But then, as the data got better, they got more data over a bit longer, they started finding there were some residuals. So if they take that one sine wave we've got here and subtract that off the data and see what's left over, here's what they were getting. Ah, so here you get quite something quite complicated. It's not just another sine wave. It actually looks like two sine waves. So that seems to indicate yeah. two things. So extra. in this very fast, your four-day oscillation, you've got a slower oscillation here and an even slower one like this. Wow, OK. So it looks like here you need not one, not two, but three planets. Three planets, OK, a three-planet system. So what do the planets look like? Well, here's an artist's impression, but really we have no idea what they look like. Um, here's uh, the architecture of the system. So here's the star, and you've got one planet here, uh, which is a classic hot Jupiter, a nice circular orbit, low electricity, um, about 0.7 Jupiter masses. And the second one's much further out, um, 0.7 astronomical units out, so about where Venus is in our solar system, and it's two times the mass of Jupiter, so much bigger. And then right over there. Oh, so this is a five times Jupiter, so it's a really big planet, two and a half AU out, so it's sort of Mars ish, but it's very eccentric, 0.4, so there's no planet like that, anywhere near that eccentric in our own solar system. So we've talked about the two classes, the hot Jupiters and the eccentric giants. We've got both in one system here. One of one, one of the other, and one that's kind of in the middle. So this thing's going to be like a giant mix master, you would think. So are we sure this thing actually won't self-destruct? Well, one thing that saves us is these things are quite well separated. So even though they're elliptical, they don't come that close. The other thing that saves us is these things are actually in what are called resonant orbits. We get this in our own solar system, for example, um, Pluto, which is highly eccentric, is in a resonant orbit with Neptune, so that for every uh, two times that Pluto goes around, Neptune goes around exactly three, an integer ratio of periods. Oh. And that means that as they go around, they always avoid each other. It's a bit like wandering around campus trying to avoid your PhD supervisor. If you know their schedule, you can carefully make sure you're always at the place they were at a different time. So these planets are doing something like that. They've got these particular ratios of their motion so that even though they might get closer to it, they never get there at the same time. So presumably that's not designed. It's actually a survival mechanism. Yes. So uh, either there were many more planets to begin with and the only ones that survived are the ones that happened to be these resonant orbits, or there was a fair bit of migration, and the migration will often tend to leave things in these resonant orbits as these are the most stable positions. So one way or the other, these multiple systems do seem to be stable. Okay. So, Paul, we can go through and we can find planets, but it's all kind of unsatisfactory because we measure the mass multiplied by this sign of the inclination. And so, are we really finding planets or are we just finding things because of this inclination effect? Yes, we don't really know the mass of any of these things on a statistical average we might know, but it's really a bit unsatisfactory, as you said. What worries me is do we even know these things are planets? All we know is it's a mass going around the star. They've got about the mass of a planet, but we don't know it's a planet. It could be some sort of you know, giant death star or some weird crystalline lattice or who knows what. So we go through and we say, well, here's a planet about the size of the mass of Jupiter. And so we say, it must be like Jupiter. We have to make that assumption because we have no measure of, for example, its density or anything, do we? Yes, and also we've only finding these things around a small fraction of the stars. If you do those calculations, it turns out about 1% of sun-like stars have these hot Jupiters, and maybe about 7% have these eccentric giants. What about the other 92%? Oh, so those other 92% could be normal, or they could be even weirder. We just don't know yet. 